You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Are you excited to go back to school but haven't heard from your friends all summer? And are you also a victim of ha- house elf bullying slash salvation? How do you feel about giant snakes in your plumbing? Having peeping ghosts distributing cursed diaries and magical birds dropping magical hats that drop magical swords on your head. Uh, this is Systematic Geekology. Uh, we're the priests of the geeks, and this is the stuff that we will be talking about today. And I think that uh, this going back to school theme here at Hogwarts is um, very important. And by the way, we're talking about Chamber of Secrets it, because all three of us on the pod are going back to school. We got Christian Ashley here. Christian, how are you? All right, Nick. How are you? I'm doing. I'm doing really well. And uh, we've got our third. We've got Judy Noel here with us. A little, a little early for that one. Preview of things to come. Uh, so we're talking about the Chamber of Secrets, but before we dive into this, uh, just a little taste of what y'all been nerding out on. Christian, what have you been nerding out on lately? Well, I just did a live stream earlier today for Friday Night Frights for our YouTube page on the paranormal for vampires. And I have been geeking out on the vampire forensics book that was written and associated with National Geographic on how it could be possible for vampires to be a thing or how they've been a a species across the centuries. It's been a lot of fun uh, just digging into that. Uh, That sounds cool. And also uh, go subscribe to Systematic Ecology's uh, YouTube channel. That's what you're missing if you're not subscribed. So, uh, uh, so vampires for Christian. Um, what I've been nerding out on is that I actually just started watching Ted Lasso for the first time, way late to the show. Um, but I got Apple Plus, Apple TV rather, and uh, that show is just absolutely delightful. I heard the hype, didn't you know, feel a certain way about it. And as I've started it, it's just, wow. Yeah, I'm on board immediately. So such a great show. Um, I can't wait to finish it. Just finished the second episode of season one. So uh, yeah, but you know, you're not here to hear about Ted Lasso. You're here because we're talking about the Chamber of Secrets. Um, but yeah, before before we jump in, um, we received our letters we talked about our houses uh, last time. We talked about the Sorcerer's Stone or the Philosopher's Stone for our people across the pond. Uh, but as we talked about that, and even we talked about our first impressions of the books as well as the movies, um, when we came to year two in our past experiences, um, after we got our letter, we're returning for our second year. Um, I just wanted to know how did... Chamber of Secrets hit y'all. I want to hear how it hit y'all when you experienced it then and maybe even um, how you feel about it now in light of uh, as a sequel to The Sorcerer's Stone. I mean, we talked about the last episode how, you know, we will protect Hagrid with our lives Mm -hmm. and uh, Hagrid gets done dirty in in the Chamber of Secrets. Um, And I just remember because I I, as we discussed, I was a movie person first before I came to the books. Uh, as as the heretic I am. But uh, I just remember watching that scene of ha- Hagrid being taken to Azkaban and I was just like, it was one of those where you're like yelling and throwing stuff at the TV. You're like, no, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this is before what we know is actually at Azkaban too. Yeah, seriously. Well, I'm like, what's Azkaban? But Hagrid should not be going there right now. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we got, we're, uh, there's a little taste of how I feel uh christian why don't you hit us with your yeah for me it was after having read the first book getting into it i think it was around this time that i read the second book we had heard rumors there's a movie coming out it's like oh my gosh yes uh i want to see that on screen too so reading chamber of secrets was like i'm going to see this on screen too and i'm imagining all the scenarios here of the quidditch match and the basilisk and uh, the the a fox to phoenix and all this amazing stuff. I, I want to see the Weasleys break Harry out of his house to save him from the Dursleys. Uh, I want to see you know Lucius Malfoy get what's coming to him for the abuse he's given Dobby all these years. Yes, yes. 
Uh, you can't see this, dear dear listeners, but uh, we're getting the double bird from Judy. No, I'm not allowed to say it. You guys told me I couldn't cuss, so I just wanted you guys to know how I actually felt about it. Just saying. And she was, she's restrained herself so well. Like, give her some credit. Yeah, I, I love this book so much more than the first book. This is this is good. Oh yeah, I uh, I love that. Um, you know, keeping it PG thirteen on the pod. Uh, Thank you, Judy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's how we all feel about Lucius Mouthway, who, you know, is a dirty trash can full of poop. But, you know, I... Uh, Great way to say that without cussing. Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. I stole that from the Surf's Up movie. So unoriginal. But, you know, that's what we do at Systematic Ecology. We make references to various movies and nerd nerd IPs. Uh, oh, yeah. But... But Chamber of Secrets, very similar, like, you know, and of course, movie person. The first one's really good, right? The book's amazing. The world building is great. But of course, at that, you know, I was a adolescent. I was probably like 11 or something when it came out. And, you know, I wanted more action and I wanted more special effects. And it delivered. You know, there's even uh-huh. from the book, you know, returning later, you've got all this different action. The world is deeper. The magic seems to be more vast. Obviously, with the movies, you get Dobby, um, you know, CGI has kind of evolved, um, you know, in a lot of ways. And um, yeah, I mean, the Quidditch is crazy good. Um, I mean, the mi- this time of movies too, the mixture between CGI and like practical effects, I feel like was at this really nice spot that I think was lost for a good 15 years. And then I think now people are starting to like come back and do back, go back to like the CGI practical effects thing. Um, anyway, it was just a really magical time and that's what I remember about it. Um, and it drew me in and here we are just nerding out about Harry Potter. Um, but because of that, we talked about some of the new elements and, and, uh, and things like that. But what were some new elements and characters that stuck out to you in the Chamber of Secrets? And which returning characters and elements uh, were you most happy to encounter again? And we'll start uh, start off with you, Christian. New elements. Visiting the burrow is like a comfort place to me. The The Weasley family as a whole, you know, they're they're dysfunctional. They're all over the place, but they love each other. Like they're in this hovel of a house that has just enough room for them to live together. They don't have a lot of money and a a lot of fame, but they genuinely love each other, love watching out for each other and then adopting Harry. Like from the moment he comes in there, he's their son. And I think this is the first time we meet Arthur. because I don't know if we see him in Philosopher's Stone, Sorcerer's Stone. And yeah, seeing this guy who's, uh, just one of those people like he's just fascinated by new things. And I'm like, I totally get that. Like you bring up something new to me. That's something I can understand easily. That's not like quantum physics or anything to do with math. Like, yeah, sure. I'm all in. I'm going to learn everything about it. Let's do this. And that's the muggle world to him. And of course, then Dobby too, uh, learning about house elves, how they're treated in this world and the juggling all that together at fleshing that out. That's the new stuff I really like. Old stuff. My boys, Fred and George. I mean, they came back. The The heir of Slytherin stuff is going on. And what do they do? Make way for the heir of Slytherin. And just standing in front of Harry, just letting him know like, hey, we're your bros. We know this isn't true, but we're going to capitalize on it to have fun with you. And Harry appreciates that. I love that so much. Ah, man. Yeah, the Weasleys, uh, you know, we get a deepening of their family. And uh, the Weasleys is a good, like, how people respond to the Weasleys, I feel like is a good litmus test for how good of a person somebody is. If you encounter the Weasleys and you're like, they're my least favorite characters in the book, perhaps besides Ron, you know, you know, well, maybe I'll give you a little bit for Ron. But yeah, like you said, if you don't like the Weasleys, you're gone. You're gone. Uh, Yeah, 100%. No. (laughs) No. No, no, no. Uh, so Judy also having very strong opinions about uh, the Weasleys. Uh, what about what about you? These new elements and also the elements that you were like, oh, I'm so glad to be back at Hogwarts. Yeah. So first things first, I want to know the spell to make my dishes wash themselves because Molly Amen. Weasley is my queen. Mm. Amen. Mm. Like she. OK, I'm going to break the rule. She is a badass. Like she 
keeps everything in line. The house might be kind of a wreck, but I tell you what, dinner's cooked, dish is done, kids are taken care of, husband's a little crazy, but she loves him, right? Um, I, I love getting that sneak peek at the Weasleys because, you know, in the, in the first book, you meet Ron, you get introduced to the family, you get a taste of Molly, but like here, now we we get to experience what I think is one of the most wholesome themes throughout the book is, mm. is the love that's experienced in that house. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the Weasleys. Um, I also love Jenny specifically because she starts off, you know, so quiet. She's timid. She isn't quite as timid in the book as she is in the movie. I think she gets, you know, she doesn't quite get the credit she deserves in the movie sometimes. Um, but knowing the person she grows into, it's it's kind of cool to like see how she to like get reminded how she starts um, in this storyline. Um, I'm also a huge fan of Dobie, obviously. Um, at first, you know, when you when you don't know what's coming, right? Your first introduction to Dobie, you're like, what a jerk, bro. Like, you're going to kill this kid. What are you doing? Like, but it's not until later you realize, like, man, he knew how bad it could have been. And he was willing to do anything to protect Harry. And it wasn't until, you know, late, of course, at the end of the book that Harry begins to realize that and then gives Dobie the best gift. And so, mm-hmm. which we'll sure we'll dive into in a little bit. But um, I also, okay, you know, spoiler alert. And, and we don't realize that the, the, or the diary of Tom Riddle is a horcrux, but yes. I love that it starts here and we have mm-hmm. no idea how important this piece is going to become as the story unfolds to the rest of the book. So I think it's really cool that it kind of, she kind of sneaks it in here, but like not really letting us know the first clue about what that's really going to look like until, you know, well into the series. Um, but my my favorite part about coming back to Hogwarts, I th- I think although it begins with um, Fred and George and Ron breaking Harry out of his room at Number Four Privet Drive. Oh yeah, um, I, I love the camaraderie. Like I love how happy they are to be back together. Mm-hmm. Like even when they're school shopping in Diagon Alley, and like they all kind of reunite. Like that feeling. Like man, I'm back. Like. I'm back at home. I'm back with my people. Like, that's a great feeling. You know, I think about, you know, times when we've been separated, you know, as adults, we can appreciate that, right? Like we, we end up getting separated from friends, you know, by distance or, you know, life happens. Right. But that moment of, of like, like reuniting together, man, it's special. So like, I can't imagine for Harry, how special that is knowing like he kind of lives in hell with the Dursleys. So the relief, the joy that had to come. And you can really feel that. You can in the movie too, but in the book, like, man, it it's very apparent how happy he is to be back. So that's probably my favorite part of being back at Hogwarts. Yeah. The uh th- just the fact that like Christian said earlier that they just adopt him immediately. You know, Harry, the Weasleys adopt Harry, and you brought that up too. And it's just like their family immediately, you know, even because uh-huh. we didn't get to spend a whole lot of time obviously with the Weasleys in the first book, but now here we are diving in. You know, I think for me, one of the, one of my favorite new things, it's the one that stuck out to me, I guess, rather than, rather than my favorite. But I remember, you know, from the first movie, seeing the scene where they go into Diagon Alley and you're just like, okay, this is the wizarding world, dude. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the from the, from the Chamber of Secrets, when they use the flu powder, and uh, they end up going to um, Nocturne Alley. And you're like, whoa, this is, that was cool. The flu powder was cool, but it's almost like this, um, oh, it's like anticlimactic sort of. And you're in this place where it's like, oh, this is not Diagon Alley. Where are we? Like this is, you get, you get that dark, you get a little intro into how dark the tone is going to set for the wizarding world. Cause we don't get started. We get the Weasleys, but when we get into like the full thrust wizarding world, it's not Diagon Alley. It's Nocturne Alley. It's dangerous um, and, and freaky. So that's one that sticks out to me. And I think probably 
sets the tone for the for the book and the, and the movie. And then, of course, returning um, is just just going back to Hogwarts, you know, just um, what J.K. Rowling does and what the movies do well is that they bring this gothic, you know, literary element of like the castle. That's like, you know, normal gothic literature. You go and you're like, oh, OK, maybe this person's connected to this rich duke or something. And now there's monsters or, you know, something like that. But Harry feels more at home here than he does in his uh, suburban hell. Um, and I think that there's just something obviously magical about being able to uh, make readers and viewers feel that strongly connected to um, a spooky, uh, you know, what would stereotypically be a spooky castle. Um, so, yeah. So I, I mentioned that it shifts in tone. And I think we've all talked about like the basilisk and and the Horcrux gets introduced and we start off, you know, nocturnally and things are just kind of feeling off. Um, and of course, you know, the books kind of grow with the characters, with our main crew here. So the older they get, the more mature the themes get, the deeper the books get, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but how hard do we feel like the shift is from the chamber of sea from yeah from the from the sorcerer's stone to the chamber of secrets and uh judy i don't know how if you feel like it really hits hard or if you're like this is a nice you know nice uh pace here you know it's interesting i told you guys that i'd kind of like looked over the outline and kind of jotted some notes down to have my thoughts together and this is one question i did not answer like i did not have notes on because i'm really conflicted i i think and i don't really remember how i felt when i first read it um But I do think now in hindsight, right, having read it multiple times, I think you fall in love so hard with the first one. Yeah. Like you you love the story so much. And like you said, she does a great job of like world building in the first one. And, and you know, the enchantments and the moving staircases and the tables that just magically you like fill up with food at every meal and the floating candles in the top of the dining hall. And, um, you know, having to talk to the fat lady's picture to get into the Gryffindor common room. Like, you know, you, you fall in love with all of these like cool aspects and you're like, man, that would be awesome to live there. And you get excited to go back for a year two and you're like, holy, what is happening right now? Like, but I do think that you're so in love with the characters that even though the shift is like a, I mean, it's a huge dynamic, like change. Like it's a huge, like it's almost a paradigm shift. Like you go from this, like just dreamy fantasy world that you wish you could be a part of to like, I do not want to end up in Nocturne Alley. I do not know what this Chamber of Secrets is, but it sounds horrid. Like, what do you mean Harry can hear the snake talking in the walls? Like, you know, suddenly you you start to experience all these dark elements and and you it is it does shift the way you you look at Hogwarts, but you're so in love with the story that I don't feel like the I don't feel like it hits as hard as it probably should now for someone who didn't fall in love with the story and was just reading it to reading it like yeah i i can see how it would probably be it almost feel disjointed but i i mean i'm biased <laughs> I, I oh, love, I, I love it. no that's you know, great so yeah inducing you know what we love judy for best bringing out all of the judy uh elements all the all the all the good things we, we love you for that judy uh christian christian <laughs> Now, I, you mentioned like the books growing up with the characters, but like they also grow up with the audience too. Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciated not being babied, you know, by an author and saying like, "Hey, like you're growing up with Harry too. You're able to go through the things that he's going through and experience them with him and Harry. Uh, it's gonna be in Ron and Hermione, as like people are about." They're very close to dying by some unknown means. Like they get petrified. Like what is causing that? Like we had like an evil person work working with, you know, wizard Hitler last, you know, book. But yeah. like this is a new element here. What happens here? How, how do we go into a, a worse villain or is it a worse villain? And experiencing younger Voldemort at this time and learning his relationship to the school and the same way that Harry has. It's like, it both feels like home to him. Uh, that may be from another book, uh, but it's that 
that sense of I am growing with them and I appreciate being handled well by a, a, an author that says, you know, you're not an idiot. You're not a child. You're growing up. Let's you can handle a lot worse themes as time goes on. Oh, man, such a great point at the, about being not being babied. You know, Tolkien wrote in one of his essays about fairy tales, about how fairy tales are wrongly um, attributed to children. Um, mm. And that, you know, he talks about as we get older, you know, we don't drink milk. We don't just drink milk forever, right? We eventually move on and eat bigger things. And so should um, writing. And so fairy tales, fantasy doesn't have to be, you know, uh, nursery rhymes, you know, and I think that JK Rowling, that's, I think you're right about growing up with the audience and how she doesn't baby the, her, her readers where, you know, you're, you're bringing all these darker elements, right? You've got more dangers. You've got the Whomping Willow, the Basculus, Aragog, like all, you know, Tom Riddle is, you know, Voldemort's just not teaming up with a bad guy. He's manipulating a child to like, do mm -hmm. terrible things like it just goes crazy but she allows us to wrestle with these things um and i think that obviously as kids we did and we're, i think we still wrestle with those things as adults and harry potter i think probably equipped us to do maybe address those things in our own lives maybe even better um or maybe better than most people who didn't read harry potter um you know it's interesting i didn't think about this like in that way until Christian, you were, you were talking about, you know, growing up with the audience and how she, you know, starts to ease us into like these darker elements. But, you know, like you said, he's, you know, Voldemort is like literally a creepy guy on the back of, um, the back of a teacher's head in the first book. But in this book, like he materializes out of the diary. And so now like, no, he's not as scary as he will be as the books come, but like now it's like the threat has grown a little, little bigger, you know, like the depth of the fear that Harry feels is a little bigger. You know, the, the, the threat grows a little bit with each book and it becomes more complex and there's more elements to it. And, you know, when you start digging into like the, the books that follow, you know, you, you start to realize just how deeply rooted, not, not as, not just for Harry in his life, but for Hogwarts and for the wizarding world. And like how, you know, the, the, that energy that, um, uh, from that one night when Voldemort, you know, what they thought had met his doom and, and <laughs> at the hands of this mother who loved her son so much that her love protects him. Like that one night, not only changed Harry's life, but changed everyone's life. Like, you know, and that, I think that's cool. Like you start to, you start to get more pieces of the story in that as Voldemort, Voldemort also grows, you know, with us. So it's kind of cool. Oh, so good. You know, and just like with everything else, these, these deeper elements of danger bring like the winds are just better, but like the stakes are so much higher than I think the first book too. So, you know, when they play the chess match and Ron is very injured, you know, and then Harry, obviously his life is in danger in every single book. Um, but I mean, the Chamber of Secrets, it's like Harry, of course, um, you know, these um, these muggle born wizards. Right. Yeah. And the half bloods and then Hermione and then, you know, Ginny, uh, who is, you know, and so and then, of course, Harry gets uh, bitten by the tooth as he stabs him. So he's going to die like all these things are like inevitably terrible. But then when these winds happen, they just I feel like also it, the 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 dangers turned up to 11 but so is the triumph um and i think we mm. just feel that victory high at the end of chamber of secrets and i think probably is part of the reason why um you know i think we, we return to it but um you know i talked about the different elements because we get introduced to so many different things the whomping willow we learn about that okay diagon alley has been extended uh, we go back to learn about Aragog and the spiders and there's a long relationship with uh, Hagrid and apparently Hagrid and Voldemort went to school together and the basilisk and moaning Myrtle, you know, all this stuff. So I'm just, that's why I'm, I'm talking in this cadence because it literally is all over the place. Um, and I think that as a kid, you're just in it, right? You're not maybe paying attention to, um, the narrative structure or what, what have you. But as an adult, that that was one of the things that as I've like analyzed it, I'm like, man, it feels a little disjointed, as you said, Judy. But um, 
not in a way that that takes away from from the magic. Um, um, I don't know though. You know, so as as an adult, I've kind of felt like it, it might be a little too much. You know, I've, I'm not gonna lie. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, it's a little too much. Um, but I might be wrong. Um, I don't know. Do you guys feel like it was just the amount of right ingredients to like throw us further down the rabbit hole of the wizarding world? Yeah. No, I think with what she's introducing here, building up on what she already has before and then continuing on with, you know, this is how you know, house elves are treated in this society. This is how, you know, this rivalry between the four houses uh, was from the very foundation of this school a thing. And just uh, the racism inherent in Salazar Slytherin's worldview was just that big that he made something away from everyone else just so his lineage could continue thinking the same way he did. That's evil. Yeah. <laughs> and I am a very convoluted writer. So I am always in favor of making something larger and epic, but tying it together in a way that even though it's convoluted on the surface, you just have to take time to read it versus like I'm throwing stuff all over the place. And here's 50 different terms for how my elves say the word snow or something ridiculous like that. Like that's a different type of convoluted. You have to learn uh, like you don't need to read the Silmarillion to understand you know, the Lord of the Rings, it enhances right. your understanding of the story. But like, and I really appreciate Tolkien made it, but yeah, like when it, and I'm not saying he's convoluted too bad, but like, he's oh, like, he is the convoluted, sure. like, no, I mean like he's the convoluted of there is a reason for everything happening here. Mm. And if you want to come on the journey with me to understand it, we can do that. Or you can just have what I have here. Yeah. yeah. I like that answer. I really like, you know, I hadn't thought about just more of like, you know, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, you can. These elements are here to prop up, you know, basically the journey we're, we're going on. Um, and that's cool that you can ride ride that train. Um, and it, obviously, I think all of us loved it. And every time I rewatch that, and even with my own adult brain, you know, criticisms, I still, I still love returning um, to the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, Judy, what about you? So, um, I actually gave this question a lot of thought today because, um, you know, there, there are, there are a lot of new elements introduced, lots of new characters, lots of new pieces of the world. And I think that my, my, you know, like my initial reaction was like, yeah, that is a lot. But when I start to think about it, like, does it feel like a lot? Because I know how all of those elements will play later on, like, I don't know that when I first read it, I really felt overwhelmed by all these new elements. I, I didn't know the weight they would carry, you know, like mm -hmm. I didn't know that the Whomping Willow we'd later find out was planted, mm -hmm. you know, for a specific reason and, you know, trying to, you know, prevent conversation or, you know, using pre conversation topics for, you know, later episodes. But, you know, when you think about all of the things that were introduced, like all of them play a deeper role whether it's throughout the rest of the series or we just hear them mentioned and there's like we get the background of of those different things later but I feel like she did a really great job of taking all those new elements and not making them she added to the depths of depth of the story without making it feel like it was just clustered I feel like mm. he introduced enough of each one to like make the story work and make it interesting and pull you in but not she didn't give us everything all at once i really think she was like planting yeah. the seeds so that they could all grow in their own time you know what i mean like that they would develop later and now if i read the second book i feel like i'd be like man so much stuff gets introduced here like things that become so important later but in that book like the only time we really talk about the whomping willow is the fact that it beat them brains off of the flying car when Harry and Ron fly to Hogwarts because Dobie shut down, you know, the the pathway to get to King's Quarters to, to leave for Hogwarts on the train. Like, other than that, other than them getting caught and, like, trying to duck and not get beat up, like, we don't know anything more about the tree. Later we will, but now it's just funny that the tree was trying to beat them up, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. You know, and as as I hear you talk, I kind of maybe feel a little bit like I'll, I'll backtrack. You know, Big Lord of the Rings guy in the Council of Elrond chapter is famous for like 
It's just talking. It's literally like Gandalf. Yeah. Let me just give you thousands of years of lore. Elrond, thousands of years of lore. Um, yeah. And as you have to be kind of a special person to be like, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm diving in deep. But J.K. Rowling does that thing where we spend just enough amount of time to, like you said, plant that seed. So we're like, OK, Aragog, there's a relationship there with Hagrid, the Whomping Willow. And then when we come back, it's these familiar relationships and characters and elements that we're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And it's not it's not too much where we're like, oh, I have to go back to the index of the Chamber of Secrets to find out what's happening. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I might be changing my mind on that. Um, I like well, it. I, I, Live, you know, on the show. With that, I think she she does a really good job of like, she gives us pieces of the background story of Harry Potter, not necessarily in any order. You know, like, it's not like we're going through like this chronological timeline. But I think she develops and gives us some of the background that's relatable to what's happening in the book. So it just feels yeah. like it fits. You know, and so the seeds that, you know, some of the seeds that were planted in the first book start to come alive a little bit more in this book, you know, um, and it, she continues to do that throughout the entire series. And like you said, she didn't give us so much when it first got introduced that we feel like we have to go back and reread the whole section. Although I did do that sometimes because I'm like, now, wait a minute. But <laughs> You know, I I just I think she does a really good job of letting the story unfold in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming, but like keeps you excited and wanting to read more. Yeah, agreed. Agreed wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, I feel I feel converted. Hallelujah. I'm saved now. You're um, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Only thank evangelism you. was that easy. No, oh, literally, <laughs> literally, though. Uh, um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, Voldemort coming back and Judy mentioned that this is, we actually get to see him basically incarnated, you know, at least he's not, he's not super tangible, but he's, he's, he's basically there. And as soon as, as, as Jenny is dying, he's getting stronger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, one of my favorite aspects of Harry Potter is just that the bad guys, no matter how close they get to winning they always lose and it's always by their own devices and you know we do get some of that in the first book but you know there's a little help from the love magic right it's still the greed and like the you know Voldemort needs the stone and can't help himself and gets killed by the love magic or whatever um which is caused by killing his parents etc 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 so yeah so that's there but this is where we directly get um the weapons a hundred percent employed by Voldemort um, with the basilisk and everything and the diary. And it's uh, he basically, the diary is left unguarded and Harry gets a basilisk fang and destroys it. And it's basically all Tom Riddle's fault for getting Harry Potter there in the first place, or at least creating circumstances where that's um, more possible for him to do. So anyway, um, is this still, you know, is that a good element to have? Like, is this, you know, Tolkien did this too, but is this just kind of a 20th century, early 21st century tr trope um, needs to die, you know, like, uh, like Tom Riddle in his diary or, um, you know, do you think it's still a good element and does it need to stick around in literature, pop culture, um, it, pop culture, et cetera, um, to give us hope in the real world? Um, yeah. So what do you, what do you think about that, Judy? So it's, it's funny. I, I never really thought about, I guess I knew that element existed. Um, and, and it makes a lot of sense when I was thinking about it, but you know, I, I think it's, I think it's kind of, um, kind of a weird, <laughs> um, manifestation of like, you reap what you sow, mm -hmm. like what, what you intend for my harm will be used for my good. Like, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that good prevails, even if it's not in a traditional sense, you know, even if it doesn't feel good in the moment, like, um, you know, you think about all that Harry's endured throughout this book. You think about, you know, uh, Hermione being petrified. You think about um, poor Filch's cat, bless his heart. He was, it's just a mess. Um, you know, <laughs> you think about, you know, poor Hermione and turning into a cat because she grabbed the wrong hair off of, you know, that's 
that Slytherin's robe. Like, you know, it's just been a series of unfortunate events and near death experiences and fear beyond belief. And now here they are laying in the chamber and the damn bird brings a hat. Like yeah. what in the world am I going to do with a hat when a snake the size of Texas is rolling around in the pipes and the diaries come into life. Like what a hat. And then, you know, you start to realize that like, not only does Fox coming show Harry's loyalty to Dumbledore, not only does the sorting hat have the power to provide the sword of Gryffindor, which is one of the few things that is going to be able to slay this basilisk, but just to go ahead and like, put the cherry on top. I'm going to take this horrid beast's fang and I'm going to like reduce you to nothing. Like all of this crazy nonsense around me. And the one thing that was supposed to destroy us is the very thing that will destroy you. Like you don't feel like it's good in the moment. And yeah, you, you know, you get this like burst of triumph at the end, but it almost it almost was lackluster when you think about all that they've endured, but it's like, no, man, like there's a powerful lesson in that. Like to be able to say, like, I don't care what stands against me. Like if if my if you know it's well will come from the heart defiles us, right? So if if I'm if I'm standing brave, knowing, I mean, surely as young as Harry may have been, surely he had to know that the chances didn't look so good, right? Like, I mean, that was a really big snake and you were down here by yourself with a bird and a hat. Like, and, you know, a a jacked up professor who's, you know, (laughs) this charm backfires. Now he doesn't remember who he is, which he was a liar to begin with and was no help anyway. Um, But, you know, his his best friend's sister's dying. There's this massive snake that he's trying to fight. Like all of these elements are just madness, but he still stood so courageous. Like he Mm. still stood like ready to take on whatever it was, even if it meant death. And he had to know that. And so I, I feel like when you, when you're, when you have that kind of commitment, when you have that kind of faith that until my last breath, to my last breath, I'm going to fight for the good. Like, it's then that we see that that change of events. So all that being said, I I love that theme throughout the books. I love that she uses all of these negative things that just feel so awful and allow them to be used for their good and for their triumph. Yeah, uh, well said. Well, so we didn't even mention our boy Gilderoy Lockhart, uh, but you know, the, the Kim Kardashian of the wizarding world, famous for fame, fame's sake, for uh, and and we hate you collectively. Uh, so you know, Christian, him <laughs> losing his memory is one of the best wins of the book. I'm just one of the best wins. Yeah, no doubt. It's oh, a yes. it's it's a it's a um, it it's a kip. Right, coward. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's a kip from learn. the point. Go ahead, Christian. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, from supplemental material, you learned Dumbledore hired him because he knew some of the people that he'd obliviated and knew that they had done those things instead. So he's setting him up this entire time for failure. That's fantastic. That's gangster. That's I gangster. Oh, uh, yeah. Dumbledore that's why start. you don't mess with Dumbledore. Die, man. No, yeah. no doubt. My God. And, uh, you also know Dumbledore also knows about the curse, too, on the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you got to think. He knows he's not going to last a year. Right. Uh, that's that's one of those dark elements where I'm like, I do love you, Dumbledore. I do love you. I did not know that. That is great. <laughs> Yeah, I just learned about this the other day while I was doing my research. But to answer the question, I love this trope because it's so true to life Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of people causing their own downfalls. How many dictators have been so afraid of rebellion that they kill the wrong person and cause it? Mm -hmm. We have Herod so afraid of Jesus that he massacres infants. And yet 30 some years later, Jesus dies on a cross and saves everyone who's Herod, some loser who failed completely. Yeah. No one cares. We have so many examples throughout history. I mean, I mean, even ourselves, we can make ourselves the villain because we act in villainous ways. How many times have I been brought down by my own pride or by saying the wrong lie or 
talking to the wrong person and beating them down and them coming back and swinging correctly against the evil that I've done. Like, it's the same way with Voldemort here, even in his Tom Riddle form. Like, he was about to be kicked out of school because he kept trying to murder Muggleborns. And he realizes, oh, well, we learn later on why he doesn't want to go out to go to the orphanage. But through his own evil and the death that he caused, he was going to lose the one place he felt like he belonged. So even just at that age, and then later on for the diary, like as Judy, you put it up perfectly, setting things up for failure there because he is so prideful, because he's so egotistical, he has to have Harry know, like, you're going to go to the depths of despair and I'm going to send this basilisk against you. You are a 12 year old wizard. You have no business fighting against this thing. I'm going to revel in you dying like the punk that I think you are. And he gets undone by a bird in a hat (laughs) that he never would have counted. A bird and an old, filthy, floppy hat. And and Lockhart as well. Like This whole time he's used the Obliviate spell to mess with people. And uh, one of the things we've talked about before, Rowling is such a great use, uh, a master of the Chekhov's gun, of Ron's wand snapping really early on because of the Whomping Willow. It backfiring on him to where he's the one, you know, like eating, you know, uh, in like belching out slugs. Mm Mm-hmm. And Lockhart, whose wand does he pick up? The wrong one. Mm-hmm. Like this whole time you've been causing other people to forget. Now it's your turn, buddy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's your turn to go to St. Mungo's. That's oh. so funny. Yes. <sighs> Man. Yeah. I think this is a trope. Like, yeah, it's idea, very idealistic, but it's also very rational too, because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who causes our own ends? A lot of the times it's us. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more with everybody. I kind of put it in there just to play devil's advocate. Um, But just because I think it it really is just, I think it's true and logical where throughout history, you see the downfall of the terrible, of of dictators and and terrible people, even interpersonal relationships where they bring about their own downfall. And even if you want to bring it to like silly casual stuff, as soon as you let yourself get in the way, you ruin it for yourself, right? Maybe there's that, well, boyfriend or girlfriend or somebody we're trying to date and you know normally we're acting cool and someone's like hey you know what she's kind of digging on you and then you you start dressing different and you start acting different and then you know you they never want to see you again because you're a gross you know the person they didn't know who you were um obviously very silly um and not but i think there's there's um a relatability there where um pride is the downfall and humility is what um ultimately has power. We see that with the hobbits, right? We see that with the bird and the hat and Harry um, as an orphan hanging out with the Weasleys with his hand-me-down clothes and all this other stuff. Um, And, you know, Dobby. And of course, you know, connecting that to Jesus as a carpenter who basically takes down the Roman Empire by dying on a cross. Uh, Anyway, very, I think that trope is, uh, needs to be incorporated more into stories. Uh, We need hope especially in a world that seems uh, like hope is hard to come by. So, uh, Amen, brother. Thanks, Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so uh, anything else we want to say about the Chamber of Secrets before we, uh, we jump to recommendations? I'm good to go. I mean, there's plenty more, but we also only have so much time. Yeah, I mean, we could talk for a really long time about this book. There's lots of really great things. Um, but if you haven't read it, read it. Like, that's that's the recommendation. That's the mm. tweet. Read the book. So good. Second second, the recommendation. Read the book. Um, uh, Doby is a free elf, oof. for the record. You'll not harm Harry Potter again. Boom! Listen... I, okay, th- yes, I do want to talk about one more thing. I just feel like this, for Dobie, may he rest in peace. I, ooh, spoiler mm. alert, sorry, mm, but still, my guy. Um, there is no, I want to applaud the actor who played Lucius Malfoy because the disgust on his face when he realizes that Harry hands him the same diary that he snuck to Jenny Weasley and hands it back to him with a big old hole in the middle of it, and gets that dirty sock, throws it to Doby, and realizes what has happened, that he has now freed his elf, is magic. 
best win of the book. Best, best win. win of the book. Yeah. Especially when you know in hindsight what he's done by allowing that diary to be destroyed and how pissed Voldemort is when he realizes. Yeah. Like it is it is the best slice of revenge and humble pie, like all wrapped up into one. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, F- for the record. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, double double birds to to Lucius Malfoy. <laughs> So, uh, listeners, you know, it's been a great time to hang out with y'all. Um, Judy, Christian, has been a great time. Uh, be on the lookout for Prisoner of Azkaban, listeners. Um, and also, Jacob Isaacs, who is the guy who played Lucius Malfoy, played Admiral Zhao in Avatar The Last Airbender. So he's just great at playing villains. And so also be on the lookout for some Avatar content. And in order for you to do oh, yeah. that, you, you need to find Systematic Geekology on Apple Podcasts on YouTube, on Stitcher, uh, Spotify, wherever you get your nerdy content. Um, And, you know, we will be here. We're going to be rocking some stuff. And uh, we just want to thanks for thanks for being here. Thank you all for being here. So just remember, too, as we end our time together, that we are a chosen people, a geekdom of priests. Peace out. This was an Anazao Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazao Ministries podcast network.